to provide a reentry packet and services on the timeline. And recommendation number 19, establish funding and oversight for reentry centers and grants. Now, I pray that you will bear with me today. This is my first time moderating on Zoom. So if I make a mistake, charge it to my head, not to my heart, it was not intentional. I'll be joined by uh, Mrs. Vanessa Brown, who is my co-host, and also my friend Josh Pickler, who is the executive director of Just City, and he'll share what that information, share about, share with you, I'm sorry, information about what his organization does. Uh, we had planned to have this meeting in Nashville. Uh, we had had, uh, the Governor Lee was going to be our keynote speaker. We also had um, House Judiciary Chairman, uh, Representative Curcio, to be with us as well, and other legislators that were going to attend with us, but due to the, the guidelines from the CDC, and with everything pretty much being shut down with COVID-19, we have changed and shifted to a virtual meeting, but we know we'll still be productive and we'll be able to share with the world what we're doing in Tennessee to make Tennessee safer and more viable for all of its citizens. So I'm gonna turn it over in, uh, in a moment to Mrs. Brown, and she'll give you the agenda for the morning, but be, be warned, there may be individuals that are in our conversation today that I will ask just to share a little bit about your story and why this work is important. Because when you say the day of empathy, empathy means that you put yourself in the individual shoes and the world needs to realize why criminal justice reform is so vital and so important. Criminal justice reform is truly a life and death issue because the decisions that individuals make before entering prison, but especially after leaving prison, could cost lives. So we have to make sure that we understand it in that vein and we see it from their perspective and work towards goals and objectives that make life, that makes life easier and, and, and creates more successful people. Our hashtags today will be hashtag day of empathy. Can everyone hear me? Good. Thumbs up. Good morning, everybody. Our agenda is short and sweet, but um, I think our agenda is extremely important. Um, we're going to have some speakers, in, and I see some other people online that I would love to say just a few words, and one would be my sister, Tony uh, Myers Douglas. Um, this work, this day for me, it's, uh, it didn't hit until today how important it is. Um, I had dedicated it to some folks, and one would be my cousin, Quentin Watson, who has uh, spent over 20 years in prison. He went in at the age of 15. I haven't seen him since he was 14. Um, also to Monroe Burns, who is my oldest daughter's father, and he's, this is year number 26. And lastly, to my brother-in-law, who I truly 20 years to do, and I believe we've, we've passed two years. Um, there's a lot of work to do, not just um, as they're incarcerated, but when they come out. These are people, and we need to love on them. So the speakers are going to talk about what touches their heart, why they do the work they do, and uh, really how we can step forward. And then we'll have a question and answer time. Um, everyone can't speak at once, but there's a chance you stick your name in there. We'll be ready to call your name and, and you can unmute and we can um, have some good uh, dialogue. Next, future engagements. I know with this virus going on, there's a lot of things we had to cancel. Um, I don't like the word cancel, I like the word postpone because there's some stuff that we still can do. We just need the Lord clears the air, and then we'll be ready to work again. So right now is the time that we gather and put our thoughts together, get our plans together. And when God says it's time, start rolling boots on the ground. 
Uh, lastly, we'll have a little poll just so we can get some information on who is online with us. And uh, DeAndre will go through some action steps with the recommendations and we'll just keep moving forward. So DeAndre. Thank you, Vanessa. Just bear with me. I remember I'm learning how to do this. I had to change the positioning of my phone because it didn't work correctly, but I'm ready to rock and roll. So I'm going to turn it over to my friend, a really good friend, Josh Spickler. Allow him to introduce himself, tell you about his work, and he may even want to share the recent work that they've done with attempting to reduce our jail population. Josh, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, DeAndre, and thanks, everyone, for joining uh, for joining this. Uh, it's really great to see all the Lifeliners. I can see those green shirts. even. Even though we're virtual, we can tell you're there in force like you always are. So it's great to see you all. Um, and it's good to be here uh, on, a, on a dreary Wednesday morning in Memphis, at least. Uh, so yeah, at Just City, we've been uh, around for about five years. And um, we, I was a public defender uh, for years before we started Just City. And so our work is closely aligned with uh, the hard, and especially these days, difficult, difficult work that they're doing. Um, in the public defender's offices across the state, but uh, in Shelby County in particular. And we've just tried to focus on policy, policies uh, that we can impact uh, from a state level uh, that will make the lives uh, of those public defender clients and their families and the public defenders themselves uh, just a little bit easier, trying to shrink this criminal justice system that has been growing and growing and growing for uh, decades, uh, trying to make it more humane, trying to make it fairer, so that if you do come into it, you have a fair shot, and it doesn't matter how much money you have, and it doesn't matter the color of your skin. And so uh, that has taken on um, a lot of different uh, looks for Justice City. Uh, our most, um, I guess, popular and um, most uh, impactful project so far has been around expungements. It's been around uh, getting people's records cleared and getting that done uh, for a reasonable amount of money. It used to cost a whole lot of money, as many of you know, in Tennessee and now it only costs $100 if you qualify for expungement. We've also done some work to expand that eligibility so that more people qualify and then can pay that, that lower fee. Uh, we had some really good legislation on the cusp uh, of uh, getting through this year, we thought, um, and we'll see what happens in June when the General Assembly comes back, but uh, uh, we kind of uh, had some um, quiet legislation come about this, uh, this session that we were hopeful would further expand uh, opportunities for people to have their records cleared. So we'll be back at that as soon as the General Assembly is back in session. Uh, we've been working really hard the last couple of weeks trying to clear out our local jail here in Shelby County. Uh, we've gotten uh, several grants uh, to the tune of $100,000 from some national folks, from some local folks to bail out as many people as we can during this uh, vir viral outbreak. Um, we're over 20 since about a week ago, uh, and we were doing five or so a week before that. So uh, we've just really accelerated the, the, the pace at which we're bailing people out. We're now keeping a very, very close eye on who comes into the jail every night, every day, uh, and who we might be able to get out. We're working very closely with the public defenders to do that. Uh, when we started this, there were probably 120 something people in this jail on bonds of less than 5,000. Uh, right now, uh, there's just a handful in the, in the teens this morning when we looked. So the people that are still in there on low bonds, uh, there's really not much we can do with our money. It's going to take uh, it's going to take lawyers and judges to get those folks out. But we're still at it. As soon as I get off this call, I'm going to go over there and and pay some more bails. Uh, I'm texting with public defenders while we talk. So if I if I seem distracted, I'm trying to get more people out of the jail. It's not because I'm ignoring any of you. Um, at the same time, uh, as we're doing this stuff locally in the, in the wake of this virus, in the shadow of this public health crisis, there is a large, large uh, population of people in this state who remain behind bars, who remain unable to do the things that everyone is telling us to do, like have Zoom meetings instead of person-to-person -person meetings. Uh, people can't socially di distance themselves. People can't practice the kinds of hygiene uh, that we're being told to practice. And so we, along with probably some of you and, and many others across the state, sent an emergency petition to the Tennessee Supreme Court yesterday, asking them to take measures like other states like New Jersey and Kentucky have taken from the top level court to order the lower level courts to do as much as absolutely possible to get people out uh, of these facilities before this outbreak really reaches its peak. Because I think uh, 
Uh, we've still got a long way to go before this thing peaks and it's really going to ravage our correction institutions and detention facilities when it does. So um, we'll see how the Supreme Court reacts to that. Our, our local uh, government here in, in Shelby County has not moved quickly enough and has certainly not moved comprehensively like we'd hoped. We've heard some good stuff from Nashville out of the sheriff there uh, and the DA have been working together, but we need to do a whole lot more. There's still 2,000 people in our jail here in Shelby County. There's more than 50,000 people across the state who are locked up and um, there's a lot of them that can be safely released and spend uh, these next few weeks um, doing the things that we're doing outside to uh, distance themselves and keep themselves healthy. So we're really focused on uh, what we can do right now to uh, alleviate the impact of this virus on the people who are in custody and their families. Um, really happy to be invited to such a great group of people and talk about this stuff and uh, um, looking forward to the next few minutes with y'all. Awesome. Josh, uh, I appreciate your comments and I thank you for the work that you're doing. Could you, since this is the day of empathy, share with the group what led you to leave the district attorney's, excuse me, the public defender's <laughs> office and start Just City? Because, and explain what Just City actually means. Um, yeah, DeAndre, I mean, you know, I was, I love the work that I was doing in the public defender's office and public defenders get a bad rap a lot of times. Um, and they're overwhelmed and there are bad public defenders and they're amazing public defenders, just like in any organization. Um, and I love the work that I was doing one on one, particular at the time I left DeAndre with people who were facing uh, severe mental illness and serious and persistent um, addiction issues. And I was working with the Jericho Project down here. And so I loved that work. Uh, but just as we began to re sort of structure that office and, and tell the story of public defense and why it's so important. Uh, we ran into a lot of, of dead ends with, uh, with government, frankly. It's really hard to operate a law firm within the confines of a government. <laughs> government uh, is a thing, and it's important, uh, and it should be run well, and there are ways to do that. A law firm is a really different thing, and so trying to operate that law firm within a government just it really frustrated us. And so we needed um, something like Just City, a public, publicly supported, uh, independent, very important, independent uh, organization that could do and say some of the things that could raise money and spend money on things like bail. You couldn't raise money and spend money uh, on bail for, as a public defender's office. You're ethically prohibited from doing it, number one. Uh, you can't do fundraisers uh, as a government agency, number two. So uh, that's, it, it just allows us, Just City allows us to do so much more uh, for the people and the families who are wrapped up in the system um, and trapped in it. So that was sort of the, the main reason that we uh, sought to, to start Just City. Um, uh, and, you know, personally, I was planning on staying at the public defender's office and being the liaison to Just City. And then they sort of tricked me. They asked me to write the, uh, the job description for the executive director job at Just City. And I did. And they said, that sounds a lot like you, Josh. And, <laughs> and uh, so and here we are five years later. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it's been the, the joy of my life to be uh, involved in Just City. And, and that's largely because I get to get outside of that public defender office and, and b help build coalitions and help participate uh, in meaningful work like this. But I'm so glad you wrote your own job description <laughs> and that you accepted the job after. <laughs> so thank you, brothers. I hope you can stick around. We may have some questions for you a little later on. Yeah, I'm I here. Believe, I'm here. Uh, Sister Tony asks, is there anything that we can sign on to to help support the legislation or the, the proposals that you sent to Nashville? Uh, the document that we filed yesterday was a, a, a legal document. Um, it had a list of signatories. And again, some of, some of you in your organizations may have, may have signed on to it, but uh, that is, is sort of a, a document pending before the Supreme Court. So there's really not a lot that we can do there. Uh, the legislation's on hold. Uh, we hadn't really even launched any sort of community um, campaigns to support it yet because it was just sort of creeping through uh, committees uh, sort of quietly, which is sometimes how we like it. Um, uh, you know, DeAndre, right now, it's really just head down trying to get people out of that jail. And we've had really, really generous support from some really deep pocketed uh, national and local funders. And so, um, you know, we need to 
to lift this up like this and, and we need to take care of ourselves. So I don't, I don't have, we're not calling on people right now to do much of anything. Letters to editors and, you know, social media posts of, of important media coverage of this are always very important. So I guess that's where I would land is if you see something on Facebook that talks about people who are incarcerated and how they're going to be impacted by this virus, share it and amplify it because um, the more people who, who do that, the more pressure there is on the, le the leadership who make these decisions to change things and to make it more, more empathetic and more, more secure and safe mm -hmm. for uh, people uh, who are behind bars. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I did not warn my dear brother Richard that I would ask him to share today before I go to our national partner, Tony, but Richard Graham uh, is one of my friends also, and he runs an organization in the city of Memphis called GIF. And I'll allow him, if you would, to share what it is and why he does the work and why days like this and the work that we do is so important. So Richard, if you could, come on and share with the group exactly what it is you do and why you do that work. Hey, DeAndre. Um, can you can you see me? I, I'm not getting a visual, but it, okay, great. Um, GIF stands for Juvenile Intervention and Faith-Based Follow-Up. Uh, we just call it GIF for short. Um, we've been around since actually 50 years. It started out as Youth for Christ really 50 years ago and morphed into GIF in 2003. Uh, we serve youth that have been through the juvenile justice system a, a minimal of three times. Uh, we merged another program in with us uh, four years ago called MARS, which stood for Mediation, Restitution, and Reconciliation Services. And their organization has been around since 1997, working with youth that have been arrested one or two times, nonviolent offenses both male and female, whereas GIF, uh, the program that started in 2003, is working uh, with male only, uh, again, youth arrested multiple times. When I say multiple times, um, you can, I say on average, it's three times, but we ran into one youth that had been arrested 26 times at age 14. Um, so I don't know all the particulars of that case, uh, why he was through the system so many times, but I do know that he lives in Raleigh, Egypt today, uh, making a great living as a long distance uh, truck driver for a company out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, his mother credits Jeff with saving his life. We also have another youth that's a policeman out of the Crump uh, police station. Um, so, we, we watch the number of kids that come through the system. Um, back in 1980 or 19, excuse me, 2014, when I became the executive director, when the former director retired or moved on, uh, we were serving 87 kids a year. Uh, the last three years, we've now averaged 340 youth a year. So that in, in one way is, is disturbing. Uh, knowing that there's so many uh, youth coming through the system. Um, and I don't find particular fault uh, in large part with the system. There's certainly things that can be done better. Uh, we can all do things better. The, the fault primarily to me lies in our community and family structure. 95% uh, of the kids that we work with are living in single parent homes. Um, you know, we have kids that get into trouble because their uh, family has, has followed a, a path of drugs and, and uh, of darkness, basically of rebelling to, to the community systems that we have. So when your mother forces you to go out and sell drugs, you know, it, it makes it tough. So we're trying to instill in these kids that uh, God's given them what they need. It's between the six inches of their two ears and it's in their heart. And we're trying to show them a better path. Uh, and that's what GIF is all about. Our GIF case men mentoring program that's working with multiple time offenders has a 65% success rate. The early intervention program, it's been around since 1997, has a 90% success rate. So uh, that's it in a, in a nutshell. And DeAndre, you didn't give me any notice, so I owe you one. <laughs> 
thank you, Richard, so much. I appreciate it. Uh, for those that don't know, Rich and I, we became real friends when we went on a, a retreat. And I'm I'm terrified of water, what I was. And this was one of those individuals that helped me overcome my fear of water uh, by having me to walk across one of those uh, string-like bridges. So this is my leak back. So thank you, brother. I appreciate it. <laughs> Relationships matter in this line of work because sometimes we feel alone. And it's good to know that we have friends you can lean on in times of stress and when it seems like there's uh, no hope. And so thank you for always being a supporter of our work and for the work that you do with our young people. Appreciate you. I want to now shift a little bit. We have one of our, our national partners who I also consider a dear friend, uh, Sister Tony uh, Myers, and I'll ask, ask her to introduce herself and share a little bit about the work that she does and why this work is so important. Remember, this is the day of empathy. We are attempting to find ways to share this uh, information with those that need to know, i.e. legislators that can create a system that is more just and, and, and sees people as people and doesn't see us as disposable. So Sister Tony, if you don't mind, could you come on and share a little bit with the, with the group who you are, what you do and why you do it? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for um, having me. I feel I feel so blessed that I'm able to participate like this. I was surely disappointed that I wasn't going to see y'all in Nashville. Um, so it's exciting that this is happening by web, um, which is a big part of my life. I telecommute our office. I'm with the Legal Action Center, and we have offices in New York and Washington, D.C., and I live in Georgia. Um, so I've been telecommuting and, and working by video for many years now while folks are kind of getting introduced to this new concept of meeting and connecting. Um, the Legal Action Center is a nonprofit law and policy organization that's been around for nearly 50 years, fighting um, on behalf of people with um, past drug and alcohol histories, um, criminal records, and also individuals that are living with HIV and AIDS. And a lot of my work has centered around um, eliminating barriers that criminal records create for folks, um, particularly um, pertaining to employment, but really everything that could impact employment, including app housing, access to benefits, um, dealing with the stigma of a criminal record. And so the, the centerpiece of our work is not just about, the, the centerpiece of our work is about um, eliminating the stigma that's attached to all of the labels that, that come with the different perceptions that people have about people who have been connected to the legal system. Um, but we also do that work in our process of trying to change and strengthen and improve laws um, that create a lot of the barriers that we know people are often left to deal with after um, having a criminal record. Um, our work also involves ensuring people have access to health care needs because a lot of, um, for, for many people that, that are connected to the system, some um, of, of their activities were often drift, driven by unmet needs that should have been handled in the community, whether or not um, it was dealing with a substance use disorder or untreated um, or limited treatment. Um, for mental illness um, and other issues that, that could come up that could be driven by trauma or whatever um, that, that has been a hindrance in that person's life and in, in, in their ability to be stable and, and, and really move forward and progress to their potential. Um, so there's a number of um, policy issues that we often advocate for, um, including, and in, in many that, that DeAndre opened up with mentioning um, in terms of some of the recommendations that did make it in the task force reports, um, in terms of increasing access to preventive care um, that can keep people out of the criminal legal system, increasing treatment access for conditions most often coinciding with criminal legal system involvement, um, increasing diversion to treatment at all phases of the criminal legal process. Um, also training um, police departments on how to divert people to treatment and care. And a lot of that work um, often starts with getting those folks to recognize the humanity 
and dignity of the people that they're coming in contact with. And so that's what's always touched my heart about a lot of the work that Lifeline has been doing in, in bridging that divide that often exists in communities where we have lost sight of our humanity as a people and as people working, we end up get, getting caught up with titles, departments, you know, jurisdictions and all of that and lose sight of the humanity of people and all of the complexities that we come with and live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, a day like today where we're, we're talking about how do we help people recognize um, and look at the journey that people um, have taken in their lives to get them to the point that they are and the potential of where they can go. Um, that's when we're really going to get some headway um, with changing hearts and minds in a way that's going to be necessary to create in the society that we wish to create. And of course, somebody would call that name. Sorry. <laughs> Lastly, a lot of our other work is, is centered around removing barriers, and of course that has to do with linking people to co coordinated health care in the community, um, increasing opportunities um, for people to become part of society that comes with being able to get the jobs that they want, being able to get paid the wages that they need in order to take care of themselves and their families, having access to higher education, um, securing the housing that they need to be safe as well, you know, safe in their community and, and just to be a participant in society through voting and whatever else running for office. So again, I'm, I'm truly excited to be with my lifeline and, and the rest of well, Josh and my family too, man, I'm sorry, Just City, um, my, my Memphis family. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to coming out to Tennessee and, and working alongside all of you um, to achieve the goals and the visions that you have for our people in the state of Tennessee. And my husband is from Chattanooga, so I'm, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a Tennessean <laughs> by marriage. Thanks, DeAndre. Thank you, Tony, for all that you do. And thank you for the relationship, for the advice, for the wisdom, the leadership, just for the, the whole ball of wax. You've been a true gem. And I don't think we'd be as far as we are if it hadn't been for our relationship with you. So thank you so much. I'm going to open the floor. Are there any other organizations? I'm using my live on my phone. For some reason, our internet died at the office. So we're having to switch from the computer to our phone. And if, is there any um, service provider that I did not allow space to share before I move on to the next segment? I'll give you a few minutes if there's anyone. Five, four, three, two, one. Awesome. Being that there are none, and I'm a preacher, so this is what you say, seeing as there are none, I'm gonna ask a few of our individuals to share just a little bit about what life has been like since being released from prison. And, and the reason I want to do that, again, it's the day of empathy and we're attempting to garner support by having people really see and feel what the actual experience is after coming off the prison. One of the things that has, has given me a little pause with the new reentry efforts is most of it is focused from the governmental level on incarcerated individuals or those that are recently released. But we are forgetting that there have been decades of neglect and abuse and lack of training for individuals that have been out of prison for several years. I've been out of prison now for 14 years. And when I was incarcerated, there were no programs. There was nothing for me to learn how to become a better citizen. There was no reentry plan done for me. So I've been having to do it on my own or with the help of friends, like those that you've seen, to get me to where I am today. But it shouldn't take an individual being rearrested, uh, going back into the system, but then to get the necessary assistance, the support that is necessary to let them become successful citizens. So in order to understand that in a different perspective, I want individuals that may not have ever had any criminal justice contact and never been directly impacted, don't know anyone that has been directly impacted, to hear from those that have been thriving and attempting to thrive in this environment, without that support, because if government doesn't understand that we also owe it to those individuals that the system has failed, we won't get any further because we'll continue to recycle people for them to give us necessary for them to 
be a, a viable citizen. So I'm going to ask, and they, they don't know it, it's coming in any, any order, but I want to hear first, first from a mother, uh, a mother of two, and uh, had a successful journey going in life, but then made some bad decisions. So uh, Ms. Gabriel, if you don't mind, just sharing for about two or three minutes why they should care, what life is like, and what you would like to see your life become if you had the support that was necessary. So you have to unmute your phone. Am I on? Yeah. I had to move up because I could hold the phone. Okay. Um, I'm Gabrielle Churchman. And what was the question again? What is it that you would... So, so if, if you were to speak to someone to explain to them what life has been like since you've been out, and what is holding you back, what you would like for your life to be from the perspective of a mother that has a record and the record is hindering you, what would you want people to know? What is life like for you right now? I can't do it. It was ready, just go ahead and start speaking. They can hear you, we can hear it's, you. It's on? Yes, it's on, you can just start speaking. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, when I when I first got out, um, I was on house arrest for six months, and it was terrible because I couldn't find a place to stay, and where I was staying, it was very uncomfortable because um, they did no background or nothing like this, so it was cash. So it was like uh, a bad place. But um, as as for a parent that, that wants to change, it's hard trying to keep stability where you keep getting denied. Housing, um, cars, if you don't have cash, like there's nothing possible for you to do. And um, when I get off house arrest, I kind of had a... Um, a better a better way of moving around because I had a certain amount of time to be in the house and a certain amount of things to do in a certain amount of time besides um, coming to Lifeline. Um, I think with um, it, for me having kids and parenting, it would be um, hard for housing situations because my house is not in my name. It's in my son's grandfather's name. And so everything I have to do, I have to do it around him because I can't get anything in my name, like nothing, even Section 8 denied me. And um, it's hard for a parent that wants to change so bad to have so much hindering her. And um, I just take it a day at a time and I thank God for this for Lifeline Success, giving me an opportunity to see the bright side of things. You don't have to do everything by yourself. As a single mother, I do a lot of things by myself. But since I've been in the program, I don't worry about that a lot, doing stuff on my own. So I really empathize with younger women and especially when we're children. It's possible to change, not only for yourself, but for the kids' future. And that's how I look at it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Gabriel, for your transparency and, and sharing with the group. I'm going to ask uh, one of our younger members, newest member, uh, Brother Tylen, if you don't mind, just sharing what, what life looks like to you and um, what are the struggles you face as um, a young man trying to make better decisions? Because as we know, the, the world is attempting to swallow you up whole and, and lead you in, in, in a bad direction. Uh, so what, what, what would you want the world to know as it relates to what, what's necessary for you 
to become the man you want to be, uh, knowing that you're still a young man and have a, a bright future if the world wants to um, Well, first off, my name is Tyler, last name Menzi. Well, when I first went to 201 for my first charge, that's not important. I had my prosecutor try to railroad me. So I didn't really know what was going on with the probation and whatnot. When I got out of jail, I ended up getting a warrant for something small, but it was a, for a past charge. And when I got to Lifeline, uh, Mr. Brown was trying to help me figure out what I was supposed to do, how I was supposed to maneuver myself into getting back into the real world. Because I had been in jail for a little amount of time, not too major. Um, so basically, when I got out of jail, I didn't have nowhere to go. I was still, quote unquote, doing the same thing I was doing before I got into jail. I just didn't have the helping hand that I needed to, you know, prosper and to be able to proceed in life. So I just feel like when it comes to re rehabilitation and getting help in jail, it should be offered in jail and outside of jail in order for a male, female, woman, man, we got kids, don't have kids, in order for them to do better in life. So, that's about it for me. Before you leave, Tyler, explain to the world how important it is, as, as a young black man in America, to have support from a positive place, as opposed to being led by the the streets that can so easily allure you away with the fast money and all those things that you can gain by being a criminal. Well, we have positivity around you. It makes you not only want to do better for yourself, but do better for the people around you. So instead of just looking at the, the flash money, the stuff that's temporary, I look at the things that's permanent, something that can last forever. With that being said, like as far as this education, better opportunities instead of me going messing with dope or stealing or et cetera, or et cetera, whatever I can do to get money, I can just be patient and have the right people around me promote me to do positive or do better things, do good things. And from that point on, it'll help me be a better person. When I'm a better person, I can help everybody else be a better person. Thank you, brother. That, 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 that was spot on. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your, your, again, your transparency and willingness to share, especially being one of our newest members, uh, to, to <laughs> tell the world what life is like and, and, and the hindrances that you've had. I think I want to try one more, and then we're going to ask if there's any questions that anyone may have. And I'm trying to figure out who would be a good person to bring on next. Let, let's see. Bring, give me one second. I want to hear from brother Alfred uh, in, in his own way and he, he's, he's and, and Alfred, Alfred is from your perspective tell the world uh, what life has been like and, and the struggles you face on a daily basis uh, because we know you and I, I know your struggle don't without going into too much detail just what is life like for you and, and what would what would life look like if you had more support if you had the support that we were that we all needed what would life look like for you um, yeah, yeah, I see. Me. Um, my name is Alfred. Um, I face a day to day struggle every day. Um, definitely dealing with mental and drug, drug and alcohol abuse. Um, and I got released from college, I got released. Um, I lived a life of untrustworthy. I, I wasn't trustworthy to no one, and I didn't trust no guy because of something. Um, I grew up, I grew up. With a single mom. Um, she took care of six kids, worked two jobs, uh, um, did all she can to give us whatever we wanted. Um, but the streets accepted me to the all the wrong. Um, I had a face to face when I got out. It, it, it was time to try to do that. And that's a hard thing to do. Like every day, every second. Um, I'm fighting, still fighting, a lot of struggle. Um, Still trying to get an understanding of life. Um, it's hard because it's something like I, 
I grew up, they took me out of the cave from me when I was 17 years old. Enjoyed all my life, I kind of been blind. Since I've been in the line, I want to thank DeAndre and Ms. Vanessa for like all the help they have done for me. And I'm trying to do, they got me glass I couldn't see before I came here. You know, um, you know, I got an opportunity like to be a life. Um, I got Medicaid, I'm trying to get Medicaid now. Um, going to get ticked out, you know, stuff I never thought about, never even worried about my health, didn't even care about it because I always thought of drugs and drinking was the medicine, you know what I mean? Um, but since I've been in the right line, I just, I just feel like, you know, I can see more now, you know what I mean? I can try to acknowledge more now too. Uh, like thinking about education, something I never thought about. They want to do nothing like that because for some fact, I was a follower. I used to follow organizations that kind of didn't mean nothing to the streets or to the world. We had the name, but um, kind of put in the short term, put in the short words. I was, I, was, I, was, I was doing all I can to be nothing, you know what I mean? But being a girl and um, being around the group of people is giving us understanding about life now and like letting us know that things can be better. And it, it's a great opportunity for me because I was a seven. Uh, I will be having a little girl, and I don't want—I don't, don't want to be that that father that still having excuses. You know, um, definitely don't want to be that father that <laughs> don't have nothing. You know what I mean? Um, no housing, nothing. You know what I mean? I just—I just want to thank right Mind for just giving us this opportunity to like work with ourselves. You know, definitely work on our behavior. It's something you can fight. Right. Thank you, Brother Alfred. Thank you. you know, again, the transparency that you guys are sharing today, I believe it'll touch the hearts of individuals that can make decisions. And Richard, his name's Alfred. And Alfred's been one of our members for a few years now. He's done all that's been asked of him. We've had some bumps along the way. Part of this work, you have to understand that you can't expect that individual that we're servicing to come and, and, and be perfect because if they were perfect, they wouldn't need our help. The help that we offer, and when I say us, I don't mean life, I mean in the individual that does this work, the, the help that we're offering has to supersede our short-sightedness and impatience because the individuals that, that we help present with issues that happened long before we met them. And we cannot expect individuals to turn their lives around at the drop of a hat. Programs that are extremely uh, restrictive and, and, and want to punish for uh, every small infraction really miss the mark when it comes to what we need to do to help our population. Uh, this is one that's formerly incarcerated, directly impacted. I know what love and support will do. And on this day of empathy, I, I challenge anyone that may be watching on Facebook Live or gonna watch this later, to understand that the people we service are people. We are not dealing with, with animals. We're not dealing with uh, material that can be easily discarded. We're, we're dealing with human beings and, and lives and, and futures. And the decisions we make when we interact should be uh, have the, the goal of do no harm and see the people as people and, and look into them past the facades that they put up to make themselves uh, seem fierce as a method of protection and callous and cold, because we understand that God didn't make us that way. And if, as long as we operate in that vein when we do this work, I think we'll be very successful. I'm gonna move real quick to questions. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom. Does anyone have uh, any questions they would like answered for the next about three or four minutes? Dr. Brennan, thank you for your comment. Are there any, any questions? And I would, if you have a question, to unmute your microphone and ask it so everyone can see, as opposed to doing it in a chat. Give you about three minutes. Hey, DeAndre, this is Richard again. Um, I don't have a question, uh, but I would like to make a follow-up statement. Um, you know, I mentioned about our, our youth growing up in single parent homes. And so much of that is driven by uh, our unprecedented poverty, uh, especially 
in the community that we work with um, climbing out of that poverty uh, is so difficult when it's gone on for so long and in order to try to turn the tide on that we try to match up our GIF graduates with what we call live life together mentors asking adults to mentor a GIF graduate for up to one year the youth and the adult actually set the frequency of those visits but we do ask for a minimum of four hours a month what most of them find out is that it it's it's a life-changing event for the mentor more than it is for the youth um, and in relation to empathy um, I think we a, a statement we've adopted at GIF is something that we are plagiarizing from Father Gregory Boyle that founded Homeboy Industries, who also was here in Memphis a few weeks ago and spoke. But he says that rather than judging uh, the people that, that we work with, the people uh, such as Alfred or, uh, or many others, uh, we should look in awe at how they've managed to carry their burdens for as long as they have. And Alfred, I uh, commend you for speaking up today. Uh, we love you. We want the best for you. Um, and if there's one thing that we should all be uh, focusing on as far as our uh, legislative agendas, it should be increasing our transportation systems here in Memphis so people can get to and fro jobs. It should be that we not only focus on getting people uh, training in forklifts, because that's a great start, but it doesn't lead to a sustainable wage. So we have to focus on what jobs can we train people for and how can we get them trained in high school, because so many are not going to go on to uh, secondary schools. Uh, so thank you all for your courage in speaking up today, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. Will there be anyone else? Hey, this is Jennifer. Um, I'm a volunteer helping out. Uh, if you have any trouble unmuting, please just wave in front of the camera. I will see you and I will help you out. Thank you, Jennifer. Awesome. I want to. Oh, I see you. So, is there someone? Oh, uh, yeah, this is uh, me, Mr. Brown. Uh, I don't think I want, I want to make a statement if it's okay. Go ahead. Um, when it comes to opportunities in Memphis, they need to be more opportunities because of the fact that once we are out of jail and you have a background, depending on your charge, it's a bunch of things that you cannot do. It's not things that stops you from being able to get a job like transportation is one thing um the background of course certain things like this so what would be the way for memphis or the world or america i say so better at this well one of the ways is, is just starting here advocating and letting people know the needs so we assume that everybody knows what life is like for those in our population See, most Americans, when they hear of a person going to prison, they assume prison provides them to high to the but they also assume that prison provides them the training necessary to become good citizens. They assume prison actually rehabilitates individuals. So when you come home with a record, they assume the only reason you're making bad decisions is because you want to. It's not that the system did not train you. It did not prepare you. They, those that are far from the problem don't understand and I'm going to play drives from my brother Glenn. Glenn Martin said, those of us that are closest to the problem also have the solution to the problem, but we're the furthest from the resources. Opportunities like this put us closer to those that have the resources. And we pray that when we have empathy and we say empathy, individuals see that and then think about how they can then be an asset. Uh, this only works through relationships. The Day of Empathy is a great idea because it removes the statistic, it removes the number, and it makes us human. And when people see humans struggling, 
I told you all the story in class that if you if your car breaks down on the road and you stand outside the car and wave, people will pass you by. But if you get out and start pushing, people will stop, block traffic, and help you push because the compassion in all of us wants us to help each other if we're attempting to help ourselves. So in efforts like this help, meeting with legislatures help, but what really works is you all being transparent and willing to share your story. There's power in our stories. And, and the, the more we share them, our collective voices, I believe, will shift this nation and the paradigm will shift in such a way that uh, those that have the ability to make our lives easier will do just that. I'm gonna shift now to Ms. Brown. She's gonna give you a couple of our future engagements and we're about done. Thank you all for your patience. Okay, I'm, I'm on my, my cell phone now, so I hope everyone can hear me. One engagement that I just wanna share, um, June 20th, which is a Saturday, and it is also the week of Juneteenth, with it, which is a African American Heritage Celebration. On June 20th, we will have a Thousand Fathers March. And the importance of this march is to highlight our fathers. No matter what, single family home, two family home, the fathers are the key to a family. Men are so important in children's lives. They are so important in their upbringing and teach them the things they need to learn. Um, I will send more information out. I just want you all just to block off that day on that calendar. Um, I pray that we can do that date, but if it does not fall on that date, the 21st is Father's Day, we will have a uh, Thousand Fathers March in 2020. It has to be December in the snow because we want to highlight these men and we want men to start networking and working together so our young men can see how powerful they are. And that is all the announcements I have. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, as we come to a conclusion of our time together, I want to make sure we thank our thank our sponsors, Cut Fifty, uh, Dream Core, uh, Resource Al Reform Alliance. If I'm not mistaken, uh, thank them for giving us this space to share. But most importantly, thank you all for taking time out of your day to be with us for this very important issue. Uh, we have to really begin to see uh, justice reform differently. Reform has to take place because if we don't reform the way we treat individuals, we'll continue to get, uh, we'll continue to have a high rate of crime, but more importantly, we'll continue to have broken people. Uh, the recommendations that I lifted up earlier in our conversation are very vital to making sure the individuals have an opportunity coming home from prison to become productive citizens. But the one that I really focus on the cost of our work and which is done outside of prison is that we need the resources to ensure that individuals that have come home don't go back. Individuals that have been out for a while and have been sliding by and but haven't been thriving need opportunity, they need support. And support is what's important for any individual but really important for our population. So as you log off today or if you see us later on and record it, I ask those of you that have a high power to pray pray that the hearts of men are changed and the resources flow and that the laws are no longer abusive but supportive, that uh, our system, our nation begins to remove the stigma that's, that's so attached to the term felon or someone has been involved, that people begin to really believe in rehabilitation and more opportunities and chances. If we do that, uh, we have an opportunity to create no, not only a safer and more viable to the sea, but a safer and more viable world. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your support in advance. And I pray you will share what we've discussed today with your friends and your people, your circle of influence, that you will contact your legislatures, legislators, I apologize, and let them know how vital this work is so that we can see what happens when we truly come together. Thank you all for your time. We are out for good.